My name is Hawk Newsom. I'm the president of Black Lives Matter of Greater New York. Uh, I'm a freedom fighter, I'm a revolutionary, I'm a Christian, I'm a proud American. What is true? The word of God? I don't know. Uh, true? Meaning truth. Wow. I've never been asked that question. I don't, wouldn't call it softball because <laughs> it's, it's, it's profound. But truth, what is truth? Truth to me is purity. It's powerful. It's not always popular, but it's what's needed. Finding out truth would require a little bit of work, and I would advise everyone to do it. I, I would say question the source, question the method being used to deliver this truth to you, and do your own research. Really evaluate the information that's being presented to you so that you can really determine the truth for yourself. Uh, how did I get involved in Black Lives Matter? And when did I become a revolutionary? I was born a revolutionary. I was born on a, a night. It was April 4th, 1977. It was a storm outside. It was thunder. It was rain. It was like a really powerful night. And on that night, uh, my mother would say a force came into that world, whether it's good or evil, as to be debated, but she always makes a, makes a joke about that. But um, on April 4th, I was born. That was the day that Martin Luther King Jr. died a different year, and also Adam Clayton Powell Jr., who are you know prominent civil rights figures. My parents met at a protest in the South Bronx. They were protesting for an African-American studies class. I would say that I was born to, 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 to walk the path that I'm walking now. I mean, aren't we all? But yet, I, I mean, I mean, realistically and sincerely, I was born to fight this fight that I'm fighting right now for civil rights, for human rights, whatever that may be, whatever form that may be. Uh, I, I grew up in a very militant household. Like people say, uh, they hear militant, they think military, but when we say militant, we mean very pro-black, very woke is a word that's used now, a very conscious uh, household. Whereas you would say, look at the employment rates. Why are blacks always suffering? Why do blacks always have the poorest schools? Like it's just a heightened level of awareness and a, desi a true desire to change it by any means necessary. And for me, that meant getting an education and eventually going to law school. My last year of law school, Trayvon Martin happened. So that was the first protest I'd ever organized. And I went to two law schools. I went to Howard University, which is really black. And I went to Toro, which is really Jewish, right? So just two opposite ends of the spectrums two completely different perspectives, and I was able to combine the two and, um, and, and come up with this, I guess, this, this, this sense of logic, this, this, this way of rationalizing that I have when it comes to the law. Uh, when Trayvon Martin happened, I had a Hoodies Up rally, and that was at Toro Law School. I had white folks, uh, uh, Muslims, Jews, uh, Christians, Latinos, they all came up. The youngest person there might have been 21. The oldest was a judge in his 80s, a little old Jewish man who wore his hoodie to stand in solidarity to say, hey, what happened to Trayvon Martin is wrong. And uh, after I graduated from law school, there was, I was, I ran, after I graduated from law school, I ran for city council right in my hometown in the Bronx. And I had a message that was different from your average politician. What I was saying to the people was the Republicans don't care about your interests. At least they don't express care for your interests. The Democrats say that they care about you and they don't do anything for you. So right now is the time for you to really value your vote and vote for someone who's going to fight for you. I ran. That message was a little too revolutionary. Uh, there's, there's things that happen in our communities, like you'll see one face in the news, in the media, you'll see 
that in a neighborhood, but what's, what you're not seeing is that these people are doing you a disservice, right? Perfect example, you'll see news coverage of a city council member who's playing with children, fighting for children's rights, fighting for housing. However, if you look at the money they raised, 30, 40 percent came from real estate developers who want to come into these poor neighborhoods and kick people out. So I ran and I told people exactly what was happening and they didn't want to hear the truth, right? They wanted something that was comfortable and something that was familiar. And to, 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 to I guess, to, to put icing on the cake, my opponent gave out free turkeys. And uh, everybody was like, how could we vote against her? She's giving us turkeys for Thanksgiving. I'm trying to give you freedom, jobs, education, right? I'm fighting for your, 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 your lives, your rights as Americans. And unfortunately, you are voting for free turkeys. It hurts, man, but this is, this is the world. This is the reality that people live in. There are issues that I had with the media coverage of my election for city council. And, and, and they're, they're really significant because I could have a press conference about those same issues today and you get media coverage. But back then, as a candidate who was fighting against the Democratic Party in the Bronx and the system that keeps my people oppressed, I would call a news uh, press conference and they wouldn't show up. Why? Because if they cover me, uh, the powers that be, which are the senators, the congressmen, the city, uh, city council members, they'd say, we won't give you a story. The next time we get a great story from one of our constituents, we'll make the call to CBS and your NBC. We won't give you this on a local level, level right? And this is the way they work. A lot of times, if I want coverage now, I'll call uh, one of the major networks and say that their competitor is on the way. Are you coming out? And then, yeah, 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 I'm on the way. Like, this is the way it works now. So um, it's, 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 it's sad because you have people who are great candidates that are not getting media coverage. And the incumbents and people doing a disservice to the community are always on the news and the constituents, constituents always see their faces. A lot of them don't even have to pay for media ads because they're always in the media. I think anti-establishment candidates on both sides don't get the media coverage that they should get because they are anti-establishment. The establishment is the status quo. And for you to challenge that, you are uprooting the, 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 the very, you are destroying the machine that everybody's profiting off of. The politicians are profiting, the special interests are profiting, the media companies are profiting. Everybody's profiting off of the establishment, right? It's, it's established, it's, it's well, and the folks who are suffering are those who are oppressed, my people, historically suffer, right? But then you have poor whites, you have poor Latinos, you have uh, poor Muslims, you have a lot of poor folks who are suffering because the status quo feeds those at the very top. We at the very bottom are, are left to suffer. Who owns these media companies? The people at the very top, right? So it makes sense for them to perpetuate a news cycle that would keep them rich. Although people won't admit to it, America is a very racist place. It was founded on racial practices and these, these practices still exist today. Maybe to the extent that they, not to the extent that they were before, but these racist practices still exist. And if you are a Christian, if you are American, you can look at the facts and say, yes, this is true. So you take Trayvon Martin and you look at the media coverage of Trayvon Martin's death Young black man who was thought to be in the wrong neighborhood was walking with a hoodie on. And a neighborhood watchman who was, let's call him gung-ho, you know, a bit too excited, saw Trayvon Martin and thought that he was a threat. Why? Because of the racist stereotypes, right? Thugs, hoodlums, 
are black and they wear hoodies. You see this on the news, you see this in movies, you see it all the time. Here you have this man with racist tendencies who's also trigger happy and he sees this young black man walking. So he follows him, he stalks him, he calls the police and eventually he approaches Trayvon Martin, Trayvon Martin dies. The biggest, most significant piece of this case that the media missed was the fact that the 911 dispatcher told George Zimmerman to stop following Trayvon Martin. When it came down to it, when it came down to it, they said that it was self-defense, right? That George Zimmerman was standing his ground and he, he didn't have to run, he just defended himself. However, you, however, you have a man who is giving a direct order by law enforcement. They told him to stop following this young black man because police were on the way. And what happened? What happened? He kept following Trayvon Martin. He accosted Trayvon Martin and he murdered Trayvon Martin. So it's, it's, it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy. Let's talk about something that's, that's happening right now. There's a case called Delron Smalls, right? Delvon Small was a black man who was driving right here in Brooklyn and a police officer who just got off work cut off his car, okay? Delron Small pulled up next to him. The police officer gave some sort of look to Delron's girlfriend. His stepdaughter and his daughter were in the backseat, Delron Small. He came to a traffic light. Both cars stopped. He got out of his car and walked over to the car and said, what are you doing? He got close to the car. The officer fired three times, pow, 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 in the Delron Small's chest. Delron died. We uh, took up the case. We wanted to spread awareness, so we shut down the Franklin Delano Roosevelt Highway here in New York City, Black Lives Matter. FDR, you can research it, it was last July, July 2, 2016. We shut down the highway. Why? Because we wanted everybody into, in New York to hear, everybody in the world to hear what happened to Delron Small. Shutting down the highway gets you media attention. Media attention goes out to whoever's listening, if they portray the story the right way. But the bottom line for us, they could call us uh, criminals who are shutting down the highway. The bottom line is, you'll know why we're out on this highway, whether you choose to take, it, take away You'll know why we're out on this highway if you choose to pay attention to it or not. So right now, Delron Small's case. Jury selection was last week. I walked in there with a Black Lives Matter Greater New York t-shirt and the judge told the attorney general to tell me to take off my t-shirt or to flip it over. The Daily News did a story about this. So I filed a complaint with the chief administrative judge here in New York City for these criminal cases. And I said that it's not fair that I have to turn my shirt over. However, on the first day of trial, there were no less than 15 cops there with either a uniform, a jacket, or some sort of clothing or lapel pin that identified them as cops. This is a problem. I think maybe Two articles were published on it. This is what needs to go out because they're saying that, I quote, a judge called this shirt provocative in the news. Provocative. This is a civil rights organization. However, you have the defendant who's been indicted for murder and manslaughter who's sitting here. You have corrections officers in uniforms in front of him. Also another one standing next to the judge. You have a ton of cops behind him, all in uniform, or they have some sort of uh, uh, law enforcement medallion on them. So you have, I'll do it again. You have the court officers in front of this officer, Wayne Isaacs, who's been convicted of murder and manslaughter. You have the court officers in front of him. You have the police officers, detectives, and whomever sitting behind him all showing support for an officer who was convicted of murder. 
and the judge feels that my shirt would intimidate or influence the jury, but you have all of these cops on the other side saying we stand up for this man. And he, how could that not affect the jury? How could that not affect the jury? So I put this story out, two articles. I sent it to over 30 news stations, two articles, right? But imagine if I would have stood up in that courtroom and said, fuck all cops. Oh, God forgive me, I'm in a church, right? But imagine if I would have stood up and said that in that courtroom. Every newspaper, murder trial for cop, Black Lives Matter leader says, F all police, every news story. Like, where, this is, this is important. This is my first, this is my first amendment right. It's being trampled upon and no one's talking about it. But if I do something that's, um, what's the word, controversial, it'll be all over the place. So, okay, here's another important fact from Delron Small's case that the media is not talking about. The officer said that he was struck in the face. However, if you watch the video, Delron never was close enough to hit him. The media is not repeating this, right? There are officers from the crime scene unit that said he had no swelling on his face. You couldn't see any injuries. There's pictures of him with showing the inside of his mouth where he was allegedly hit. There weren't, I, I haven't seen them in mainstream news, but the, office, the, the reporters tweeted them. This is a major story. An officer <laughs> shot a man lied and said he was hit, and then inflicted a wound on his, himself. Why isn't this story being told? But they rather show people, you know, crying. They'll show his lawyer telling the story of Delron being some sort of, oh, I don't know, bad person, but they won't talk about what's really happening. The truth, they won't tell the truth, and it's out there. It's, it's on video. It's, it's, it's in statements given by uh, tons of people, but they won't show that. His family, because I represent the widow and these other activists who always let people down represent the family. <laughs> I'm just telling the truth. <laughs> and uh, so, so the brother was like, oh man, why'd you do that? Don't talk to the media. And, because they want to stay away from him being hit. But the bottom line is they ignored uh, they ignored that aspect in Trayvon Martin. And, and, and they just said, hey, Trayvon never touched him, which wasn't the truth, like it was a fight. But this shouldn't have been a fight if George Zimmerman would have listened, right? So things, if they'll let you, the media is a weapon, right? Mainstream media is a weapon. If you say the right things, right? But they make know this, right? There are people on both sides. When I went out and did that thing in DC, hardcore black activists were like, no, you can't be, you can't talk to them. They're Trump supporters, they're evil. There are people on both sides who just want us to go to war. I'll fight, but I just, if I can avoid it, I will. You know what I mean? Like, if I can avoid it, I will. Media is a weapon. If you say the right things and they air them, it can help you tremendously. You can reach people, you can convince people, you can have a really, really massive impact. There are people who've made careers at influencing the media, right? You look at Donald Trump, who I, I really don't like using as an example, but everybody talks about how bad of a person he is. We see what his policies are. But separate the man from the campaign he ran. If I'm not mistaken, he was able to stay so relevant that he didn't spend a dime on media advertisements until after the primaries. I mean, realistically, he didn't have to spend any money on paid advertisements because he said things that the media liked. So you can use the media. And what I do with Black Lives Matter is I've been able to 
influence certain people, certain elected officials, kind of sway public uh, perceptions and, 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 and sentiment through the media, which is why the media is a gift for me at times. At other times, the media is a curse because they think of us as thugs. Uh, thug, by the way, is a new word for nigger, right? When certain black people hear folks say, in these thugs, we hear nigger. It's just, if you look at the, the verbiage and the way that it's used, they just interchange those words. So um, manipulating the media cycle, it's tough. There has to be a number of factors working in your favor. It's best when there's a slow news day. Uh, you should be looking to say something that the media doesn't always hear. Uh, you should want to stand out from the other people speaking on your topic. I think that I'm fortunate in a way because I like to bring God into what I'm doing. I pray before I give speeches. I pray before marches. I pray before press conferences. So if you take somebody who's working from a uh, who's being held accountable to a higher power, to someone who is, you know, just saying what needs to be said, then I might have a little bit more of an influence. But there are times where I go off on my own and I say things that are ungodly. And, you know, I mean, I'm not perfect, but sometimes my emotions take over. But uh, as far as manipulating the media, it just there has to be factors that work in your favor. And like I said, the media is a weapon. If, if you are able to get your message out and these stations air it, and, and maybe if it goes viral, then there's so many people listening to your message. Our, our message at the Patriot Rally, right, the mother of all rallies, had 48 million views. Like, that's amazing. You know how many people that is listening to what we're saying? So how do we harness that energy into legislation? People don't like bad cops. Some people don't like all cops. Some people will just say, hey, I don't like bad cops. Well, we are creating anti-bad cop legislation, okay, that will affect all of us as Americans. And now you have, I don't know, let's say half of that, 20 million people who want to hear what our opinion is on that. And that's a great place to be. So we went to a rally early. Okay. So the day of the mother of all rallies, we had originally planned to go to Washington, D.C. to protest it. But we heard about another rally in Richmond, Virginia, which is an open carry state around the statue of Robert E. Lee. And we were, so we decided to go there and protest. We went there, uh, we linked with local organizers, and it wasn't much of anything happening, right? We outnumbered the, you know, Confederate type protesters, I don't know, maybe 20 to one. Not too many of them showed up, so it was time to go back home. On the way back home, Angelique Kearse was driving the Black Lives Matter Greater New York van. And her husband died in police custody. He, similar to Eric Garner, he said, I can't breathe. I feel dizzy. They left him there for 15, uh, maybe 20 minutes, and he died. So right now what we're working on is a law we call it Andrew's Law, that says if a person complains of an injury at the scene of an accident, police officers must call a paramedic to that spot, which makes sense. This is something everybody should get behind. Well, she's driving and we get to Washington, D.C. And she's like, oh, my God, I've never been to D.C. I was asleep in a passenger seat and I woke up and was like, wow, we're off course. Right. <laughs> and uh, so she said, I've never been here. Then uh, Jay, uh, another member of our group who's been with us and at, when we protested the Republican National Convention, uh, Charlottesville, he's he's a soldier. He's always there with us. He said, I'd never been to Washington DC either. So we decided to get out and then there was another voice in the back of the car that said, hey, y'all know the mother of all rallies is happening. So we took a vote on if we would go or not to protest. It was a unanimous decision. Everybody wanted to go and protest the patriots and the white supremacists that were there. 
So we walked up, there were people who were cheering for us like, yeah, just in time. But when we arrived at the scene, at the site, people started booing us, heckling us. They were saying, uh, USA, USA, this is our country. If you don't like it, then leave. Newsflash, black people built the White House and the Washington Monument for free. So if there's anybody who has a right to be there doing anything, it's black people. That's just common sense, right? How are you gonna tell people to leave a country that they built? That they've been in for 300, 400 years just because they're dissatisfied. If there weren't dissatisfied people on American soil, there would have never been an American revolution. If those folks who were peeved at the at the Brits or whatever, <laughs> like if they if they if they were if, if they were peeved and just left, there would be no America. There's an America because dissatisfied Americans took control of their destiny, fought back, and won their rights, won their independence, won their freedom. But I digress. Washington, D.C., we're standing uh, to the right of the stage at the mother of all rallies. And we had just stepped up and people just started just, I guess, flocking to us. First, there was the militia. Then there were people uh, uh, who were just there to participate, booing us, heckling us. We stood there defiantly with our fist in the air. So we're standing there, we're chanting, Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter. The police are nervous because they know if this group tried to attack us, we, we, it was eight of us there, we were outnumbered about 200 to one, right? They knew if that group tried to attack us, there was nothing they could do, okay? And we were fine with that because we believe in fighting for what's right and taking a stand when necessary. So they're, 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 they're chanting back all lives matter. They're, they're making comments. It wasn't violent, but it was definitely contentious. And, you know, we saw a few people who were in Charlottesville and who we had butted heads with a few weeks prior. And out of nowhere, one of the guys said, you guys want to go on stage? <laughs> what? Like, out of everything I'd expected to hear that day, that was the last thing. So I looked over at some of our members, you want to go on stage? They were like, yeah, whatever. And we went up. But walking up to the stage, and definitely when I got on the stage, my mind state changed. It wasn't fear, it was God, right? And something said, tell them who you are. Make them understand who you are. The average person there, what do they know about us, right? They know what the media tells them. They think that we are anti-white because that gets covered. Uh, they say that we are terrorist sympathizers because when people call us terrorists, the media doesn't spell that notion. Uh, they blame the killings in Dallas on us. There were five police officers killed in Dallas covering a Black Lives Matter rally. Was this man who did the shooting um, Black Lives Matter member? Was he a member of an organization? No. Was he upset with racism in this country? Yes. Police brutality? Yes. But was he representing Black Lives Matter there? No, he wasn't. However, everyone in America thinks Black Lives Matter caused the death of those five cops in Washington, D.C., which couldn't be any further from the truth. But this is, you know, this is what they allowed to be um, to be put out there. And um, I think realistically, if the media really wanted to cover Black Lives Matter and police killings and the killings of police, then here's what they would say. A black person gets killed by the police under questionable circumstances. Black people rally. The cop goes to court and no matter how questionable, it always seems as though the cop walks away. Does this always happen? No, sometimes the cops get convicted, but it just seems to be a reoccurring theme. 
And then there's someone, no, no worries. And then there's someone who's mentally ill, right? Who is sick of this cycle repeating itself. And he gets a gun and he goes out and kills police officers. So they say, stop Black Lives Matter. That's what you see in the media. But what you don't see is stop police brutality, right? Because this is the, 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 the common theme in all of these cases, right? And you could just open your, open your, um, your phone and you can look at a cop kicking people in the face. However, they say BLM is anti-cop. No, we're anti this happening, right? And if it's happening with cops across the country, can you blame people for being anti-cop? I can't, I, I'm not anti-cop. There are members of my group who are, right? Because I know, like, I know cops who are, as people, decent human beings. But can you honestly look at, when's the media said, let's look at law enforcement in this country in their engagement with black communities. You ever saw that? Like, you ever saw that on the news? Like, let's look at the history of blacks and black communities and law enforcement, and let's try and figure this thing out. What will you find? Black people's first interactions with law enforcement were when they were uh, deputized slave catchers. And what did they do? They arrested runaway slaves, but they also arrested free people who had their papers. This isn't a myth, this is a fact. You look at the 13th Amendment, you're a free person in this country unless what? You're in jail. And then you had folk, black folk being arrested across the now free United States and working for free as slaves again. Why doesn't the media put, tell us this story? Why? Because people like you and I will sit down and say, let's figure this out. And guess what? It disrupts the establishment. People make money off racism, hatred, fear, right? This is big business. The media companies definitely do. And um, we just have to figure out how to get our own truth out there so we don't have to rely on the media as much. Uh, common ground. The way that we find common ground is people communicating and looking at issues that touch their hearts. Like at the mother of all rallies, you had folks who were patriots, Americans, and who were Christians. So we can relate there. So let's look at how, as a Christian, you don't want to see a man being choked to death and not receive justice. You want to look at, as a Christian, how Jesus helped and healed poor people. Then you could talk about health care and taking health care from millions of people. These things, these instances, is how we come together. It has to be us putting aside our petty differences and really coming together to help one another. Uh, we're here, bed Stop, Brooklyn, home of Biggie Smalls, at the uh, Community Deli. We're in one of those communities that we fight for all the time. You have um, poverty, you have a need for services, a need for programming, needs that have yet to be fulfilled by politicians or by wealthy billionaires who call New York home who could have done this before they were actually elected to the presidency. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my thing with Donald Trump and my, one of my biggest problems with Donald Trump, with his money and his means, he could have done some really great things for the country. Uh, even before becoming president, he could have, if he really cared about black folk, he could have helped them before he became president. What place better than New York City? He could have done all of these things in New York City. However, he didn't. Can, can, Jim, can, can he kind of stand next to me for the summer? Yeah, take off the title, man. Actually, we're here on Marcus Garvey Boulevard. Marcus Garvey is, where is he? That's that man right there. 
and he was the father of Pan-Africanism. It's a concept that, that, that's founded in the fact that all black people are interrelated, so they should come together as one. Uh, I don't know if, if everyone agrees with me or not, but when white people come from anywhere in the world to America, they kind of assimilate easily, right, with the dominant class. But when black people come over, there's these walls that are built up, right? So whereas we could have bridges built, let's say white folks are building bridges, black people build up walls. They say, oh, you're from Jamaica, I don't like you, or you're from Africa, I don't like you. And then the Jamaicans will call us lazy Americans and the Africans would call us cotton pickers, right? But we need to learn how to work together with one another because I don't believe that our help is gonna come from uh, government assistance and things like that. I believe that our help comes from building a community Right, working together, building our infrastructures in our communities, group economics, right, working together, supporting uh, uh, each other in business ventures and things like that. That's how we get what we want. I think that the white people who voted for Donald Trump, who don't align themselves with white supremacists and those with hardcore uh, racist beliefs. Um, they have to make some sort of uh, penance, okay? They have to come clean and say, hey, I am not affiliated with white supremacists. I am against racism. They have to step up and say that because by voting, they put themselves in line with folks who hate Jews, who hate blacks. So they have to make their messaging clear. And if they want to work together on how to do that, then I'm, I'm all about it. Because it's not just saying in the media, hey, we're different. It's actually doing something about it, right? It's actually helping with programs that will help inner city communities. It's like, okay, we need trade programs. We need to teach folks how to program com uh, computers. Uh, we need future programmers. We need folks, I don't know, doctors, lawyers, engineers, Go into those communities and help out. That's something you could do, right? Or you could stay in your own communities and talk to people about racism. Talk to people about Black Lives Matter and how we are not hate-filled terrorist devils, right? Uh, talk to them about that, kind of bring them in out of the uh, wilderness of ignorance. For people who vote for Donald Trump to get lumped in with white supremacists and extremists, it's true in a lot of regards because you have the KKK who are marching the morning after Trump won the election. You have alt-right groups and groups that call themselves hate groups that are holding up Trump signs at their rallies. There were Trump signs in Charlottesville, right? So let's look at the flip side of it. Folks who vote Democrat, are they aligning themselves with leftist extremists? Are they aligning themselves with uh, people on the left who want to exploit and oppress uh, black people? Yes, they absolutely are. Uh, my hat is Malcolm X, right? On my hat, there is a sign of Malcolm X. People don't know how to interpret Malcolm X. They knew early Malcolm X, but did they know Malik El Hajj El Shabazz? Post Mecca Malcolm X who came back and said, hey, I'm a child of God, I love everyone, and I'll work with anyone and everyone to fight racism. That's not the narrative that the media wants out there, so what you hear is, by any means necessary, Malcolm, I hate white people, Malcolm, with the AK-47 by the window. Drop the hate for a certain pe people, keep the AK-47, and then replace the hate with the love. And he's saying, hey, I'm here to fight for what's right, with anyone who wants to, and I agree with that. So we look at people on the left who, oh, Malcolm X, which is one of my heroes, he said that, I'm gonna paraphrase, Malcolm X, I'm gonna paraphrase a statement by Malcolm X, where in which he said that the liberal, the white liberal, 
is one of the biggest enemies that black America has because you have these folks who pretend to be your friends and they're truly exploiting you. Me personally, personally, right? If you have a Republican who's conservative, who's for programs, if you have a Republican, to tell you the truth, if you have a Republican who is a racist and not ashamed of it, I'll take him over a Democrat who's a racist, who covers it up, right? Who'll call you nigger at home, but won't say it to you. Give me the guy that says it to my face. Because he could say, screw you nigger. I'll say, screw you cracker. And we'll say, okay, I love America, good, me too. I love the Bible, good, me too. Let's look at it for what it is and let's figure out some answers. All right, so fuck you, fuck you. How can we work together to fix some of the things we, neither one of us like? We can work together. But if you have somebody who's acting like they're my friends, right, and, 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 and acting as if they're working against me, but they're really working. If you have a, a liberal who's at, or a progressive, let's liven up the language here, right? If you have a progressive who pretends to be my friend, however, he is not truly fighting for me, then I have a problem with him because you are just deceiving me. There was a great philosopher, his name was Curtis Jackson, and he said, I'd rather a thief than a liar, because a thief is after my salary, but a liar is after my reality. So you have the Republicans, and they just want to keep us oppressed as a whole, right? And they're saying, hey, we're fighting for you. We don't want you to have health care. We don't want you to have good schools. But then, you have these progressives that are these Democrats that are lying to us. Like, I'll help you. I'll fight for your schools. I'll give you equal opportunity. However, our schools still suffer. 50 years later, we're still suffering. Uh, there's still crime. There's still so many needs that have yet to been met. And they've been our friends and they've been advocating for us for so long. In the 1960s, there was a political shift, right? Uh, this is around the time of Dr. King. The Republican Party said, okay, if we side with Dr. King, we're going to lose our base. So let's stay here. Let's, 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 let's stay. Let's be pro-white. Keep that agenda intact. And let the Democrats bend and LBJ. Let them fall. We're going to stay hardcore, true to the South, right? And they, they, they stake their flag, and they've stayed true to it for, for decades, right? But the Democrats yielded so that they could get the black vote. And what have they done with it? Yeah, we've had some victories, but my people are still suffering. Like, who's really fighting for us? Who's really fighting to help make life better for black folks? Like, you could say, oh, pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Yeah, there's some that can do that. However, poor underfunded schools, drug infested communities, uh, homes that are devastated by mass incarceration. How can you fix that? You don't fix that by throwing everyone in jail and not giving them therapy. You fix that by really looking at what's going on and seeking answers and really doing something about it. And no one's done that yet, right? Being, living in America as a black man, I'm constantly traumatized. I'm traumatized by the statistics that I see. I'm traumatized by what I watch on the news when black people are choked to death. I'm traumatized by what I see on social media, black men being shot in front of their families by the police and nothing happening, black men with full carry weapons permits. I'm traumatized. Where's the help for my trauma? Who's addressing my needs psycho psychologically? These are things we don't look at. I, I see schools with old books and teachers that don't really care. This is what I see day to day. And you tell me it's not institutionalized? You tell me pull yourself up by the bootstraps and make it work. How can you when you face so many disadvantages that are government sanctioned? When we think about media coverage and how they portray these issues affecting uh, communities. They, they, they say that, that, that everything is separate and equal, but the coverage of 
black cases is very different from the coverage of white cases. You look at victims and why we fight in the Black Lives Matter movement. There was a killing of a white woman by two police officers. She was in her pajamas. She may have been mentally ill. Both officers shot her and one officer shot her. The next day, uh, the, the, the news report said yoga instructor shot dead by police officers. And it talked about the whole situation and who she was, her friends. However, when a black person is killed by the police, it lists that they were arrested for smoking a joint 20 years ago, right? They, they were arrested for outstanding parking statistics. It's parking statistics that they were arrested for smoking a joint 20 years ago, right? That they were arrested for unpaid parking tickets. But, like, understand, sometimes that it's even worse, but when a black person is killed, they're villainized, right? And when a white person is killed, they are victimized. Villainized, victimized. And that's no one else but the media. The first thing you hear when a cop kills someone of color is their criminal history, if they're an alcoholic, they were a woman beater, they were, who knows? You only hear the negative. They may have been suspended from school or fired from a job. You always hear that. But when it's the inverse, when it's a white person, you hear from their friends how great of a person they were. We have to launch campaigns to prove to society that, social media campaigns, to prove to society that they, they were actually good people or that they didn't deserve to die. Or that just because a man was selling loose cigarettes or because a man was having an argument, he didn't deserve to be murdered by the police. We talk about the Constitution. The Eighth Amendment protects against cruel and unusual punishment. So should a man yelling at a cop be shot to death? That's cruel and unusual. Why do we have to fight this? Why isn't the, the media portraying this for what it is? That's a problem. We look at the opioid crisis in America, right? White people, opioid, white people drug problem, opioid crisis. Black people drug problem, war on drugs. Black people, white, black, white people, opioid crisis public health emergency, black people, crack cocaine problem, war on drugs. Give the white people assistance and treatment that they need. Give the black people victims and dealers jail time. There's a problem. And I was watching Fox News the other night. I watched both. I want to know what everyone's saying. I was watching Fox News the other night, and there was a father, uh, a, a white man of means. He was on the news, and he was like, my son didn't deserve to die as a, as a victim of his addiction. And what America has to know is these are real people dying from these drug problems. What does that imply? that the blacks who died, that the black mothers who overdosed, that the black fathers who overdosed, that the black kids who overdosed, they weren't real people. But this is what the media allows out there. Now, I watched Fox after our appearance. I watched Fox after, uh, I watched Fox after the Moore rally, right? The mother of all rallies. They said that we stood on stage and that we said we loved the police. So easily manipulated. I'm not anti-cop, but I don't love the police at all, okay? I do not approve of the way they treat my people. And I know that they are the gatekeepers. I know how to fix the problem with policing, and that's through legislation, right? That's through pressuring politicians. That's how we change the police. With that being said, this is what Fox News said. They said, you... They said we love police. We don't love police officers. Like, you know, really? Like, what about me says that I love police? People who arrest my folks for no reason, who treat them differently than other Americans. How could I love you, right? I, I understand that you have a job to do, and I understand that in that profession, there are people who are bad, okay? And all I'm saying is that when they are 
when they break laws, when they behave in an illegal fashion, that they are subject to the same sort of prosecution as everyone else in this country. That's it. That doesn't make me anti-cop. That makes me pro-justice. That was good. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to talk about um, kind of because we've Go right ahead, you hear um, the inverse situation of complaints against the media in terms of uh, coverage of uh, racial interracial crimes, like for instance the uh, the Dylan Roof shooting in Charleston, and then there I think there one of the things that was popping up on social media was there was a shooting in Tennessee, in like I think it was like a couple months ago. That was a, a black man shot up a church, and and so right. people were saying, oh, that the Charleston shooting got this big media coverage. That shooting got nothing because it was the inverse, you know. So how would you how would you respond to that? Who did the black guy shoot? People in the church. He shot black people. He shot white people. Who did he shoot? White people. He killed black people. I mean, white people. It was a racial. Well, I. So, I just so I just want to look at it real quick yeah, yeah, so I can know what I'm talking about. Yeah. yeah. It was uh, revenge for a white supremacist massacre at the Trump. So that's what they're saying. Let's, uh, here, read the article there. <laughs> Shit is crazy. This is crazy. How many people were killed? Wait, uh, shot six other people walking. Police said Samson mass and wearing a tactical vest fatally shot a woman. I don't understand why I haven't heard of this. Like, that's unbelievable. Uh -oh, I think I lost it. No, I got it, I got it, I got it. Diverse congregation with people, various ethnicities. Okay. Yeah, but it was it was a diverse congregation, right? This is what's funny about the media. All the victims in Nashville were white, but it is not clear whether Samson specifically targeted them based on their race. That's bullshit, right? <laughs> it's bullshit, and this is this is me talking about a black person who killed white people at church, and the media spin saying that they don't know if he was targeted because he was black. It's bullshit. I mean, like, uh, you have, what I'm saying is I'm, I'm not a hypocrite, right? So you have, I don't understand why I never heard of a story in Nashville of a black man who went to a church and killed white people, right? He, he killed one, he injured about six more. I don't understand why I never heard that story. And what's more amazing to me is I have over three, I don't know, three, four thousand friends on Facebook. I've never seen that story published. So I don't know why it wasn't national news, right? I don't know why it wasn't national news. It's interesting to me. We need to find a credible, non-biased news source that will report the news from both sides equally, right? Both sides of the race card of, of the political spectrum equally, because you have Dylan Roof, who identified with white supremacist groups, alt-right groups, and he went into this church and he killed nine black people, right? And then you have this black man who was, who we imagine is unaffiliated with anyone, who goes and targets six white people, both 
crimes, right? Both equally like heinous, but it what takes it to another level with Dylan Roof is the KKK has been killing people in this country for two centuries. For two centuries. And nothing has been done about it, right? Some folks have went to jail, but nothing has been done about it. And you read a report from the media that says that the FBI released a report that the KKK infiltrated law enforcement. And you see reports of police officers in the South who resigned because they were discovered to have been in the KKK. This is a serious issue. And then you have a person who's running for president. And he's endorsed by Klansmen and he doesn't reject those endorsements. This is where it's a problem, right? Because you have a hate group who's carried out terrorist acts. No one can deny that. I mean, by definition, they're a hate group. By definition, they've carried out terrorist attacks and threats. Why isn't the media showing people all over the country denouncing the KKK, saying that they're wrong. Like, I, I just, I don't understand, like, why the media has a problem with denouncing white supremacy, right? Like, this is, some, this is a problem. This has been a problem for 500 years. Like, why do they have a problem denouncing white supremacy? I, I just don't get it. What do we need? We need truth. We need truth in media. We need to open up our eyes to both sides. Like I told you, I watch Fox News. I also watch CNN. I've been on CNN before. Fox hasn't invited me up <laughs> for all the obvious reasons. But to be perfectly honest, you need to see what's coming from both sides so that you can understand what's really going on. Like I have conservatives who are my friends. And I read their timelines, and they come in and they comment in, in my timeline. And it's good to know what the other side is thinking. Some folks are trolls. They don't want to know the truth. You can present them with fact after fact, and each time they'll find a reason to destroy your logic. Some things are infallible. I mean, some things are just absolute truths. Certain, certain things you just cannot deny. However, they will deny them. That's a problem with the individual. We don't need those people, right? Those folks who are that against the truth, who are, 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 are against equality, who are against peace, love, I'd say they're even against God. If you don't want to hear the truth about what's causing a certain, if you won't accept empirical data, absolute truths on what's causing harm to a certain group, then you have a serious problem within yourself. And I don't know who can help you. I don't care to deal with those people. Those people are the enemies of all things that are good. They're just something evil about them. But the folks who have an open heart, you don't have to share my politics. You don't have to agree with everything that I say. But if you could just look at this and say, hey, that's right or that's wrong, then you might be on your way to solving some of society's greatest problems. We talked about Trayvon Martin earlier. This is perfect, because this is politics in America. I was running for office. I was running for office. And my campaign managed, I was running for office in maybe 2012. And I was running for office. For, I was running for city council in New York City. And there was a Trayvon Martin rally led by Al Sharpton. Jay-Z was there. Beyonce was there. Trayvon Martin's family was there. Everyone was there. And I got there a little bit late. So people were standing around taking pictures. And my campaign manager said, come over here. We're taking pictures with all of these celebrities. You need to be here. However, I saw a few people walking away. And I'm like, we're not marching. We're not doing anything. And it was like, I'll march. They had a banner. It was four people on my staff and maybe six of them. So I said, let's march. Let's take the Brooklyn Bridge. The whole time we're marching, my campaign manager is on my, on my phone. Like, you need to be here taking pictures with these politicians and celebrities. I was with the people where I, where I belong, right? 
and we led that march across the Brooklyn Bridge. About midway through, there were cops to my left and my right, and there were cops on scooters, right? I look up, there's a police helicopter, and there's photographers everywhere. And I look behind me, what started out as 10 people was now 3,000 people on the Brooklyn Bridge. And it was just amazing, right? So we marched across the Brooklyn Bridge, we marched to the Barclays Center. We gave speeches there. And the Daily News, I like the Daily News in New York, right? I was, I was in the paper, it was like Jay-Z, Beyonce, and then it was me, this big page, page, this big picture, my fist up, marching across the bridge, and it read, it's not about black or white, it's about justice. Maybe I was on to something. Maybe I was on to something in DC. Maybe if I talked about it in the forms of justice only, that might be common ground for people where they join the fight. But it's hard for me not to talk about centuries of oppression and racism, right? Like, why do I have to disarm my message to get other people to join in? Why can't they just say, you know what, five centuries of racism and oppression, they built this country, they still don't have rights? That's wrong. That's an injustice. Let's help them fight for justice. Let's uphold a constitution. Let's really make America great.